every morning as the sun rises, it brings back to the world color, which was lost in the darkness. And the life of everything we look at depends more than most of us realize on color. Why is a rose red in sunlight? And why in moonlight does it lose almost all its color? To answer these questions, we must ask another. What is color? In the first place, the color of anything depends on the light which is shining on it. For color is light, and light is color. All colors come from the light of the sun. In the rainbow, you're seeing rays of sunlight falling on a screen of raindrops. The raindrops split up the sunlight into the seven colors of the spectrum. We can show the spectrum artificially by using a spectroscope. The white light takes the place of the sun. As it passes through the prism, which plays the part of the raindrops, it splits up into its colored parts, the colors of the rainbow. Doing it the other way round, we can collect the colors together and they become white once again. We can show this another way by means of this wheel. It's made up of the colors of the spectrum. And as it turns faster and faster, the colors combine, and the result is white. The surface of anything you look at is absorbing some color rays and is reflecting the rest. What it reflects strikes the eye, and that's how we get our impression of color. If an object is absorbing all the color rays and reflecting none of them, we call it black. If it's absorbing none and reflecting them all, we call it white. A red rose in sunlight is absorbing all the colors except the red, which it's reflecting. When a man paints a picture, he pleats the canvas in such a way that it reflects certain colors. When he prints or dyes a material, he's doing the same sort of thing. For thousands of years, man has been painting and dyeing things without a real scientific knowledge of color. He made his colors from grasses and flowers, mosses and seaweeds, and ferns and barks and roots and berries and other natural substances. Even today, the people of the Hebrides still use this method in making Harris tweeds. But though some of these natural dyes are first class, they're limited in their range, and it's often a long and difficult job to make them. We obtained all our dyes from natural sources until the 19th century. In this period, British science discovered a source of color in the most unlikely of all material, coal. Coal is all that's left of the vast forests which covered the earth in prehistoric times. In fact, coal is the vegetable substances of those forests, which owed their luxuriant growth to the light and heat of the sun. It was from coal tar, then the useless residue of the gas industry, that an 18-year-old English chemist called Perkin discovered in 1856 a rich mauve dye. From his discovery came a great new industry, the manufacture of synthetic colors or dyes. Direct successors to Perkin are the skilled scientists working in modern laboratories. And still today, as they continue their explorations into the unknown, their basic materials come from coal. Like most scientific work, the discovery of a new dye is by no means easy going. Take green, the most common color in nature. The scientist, unlike nature, finds it a most difficult problem to make a good green dye by artificial means. As early as 1912, a brilliant green dye was evolved. This was the sort of dye known as VAT dye. VAT dyes can't be used for colouring material directly because they won't dissolve in water and won't take directly on the fibre of the material. And so they have to be treated with chemicals which change them into a form which can be easily dyed onto cellulose material like cotton. But in 1912, when this was tried with the new green dye, it was found the green wasn't fast. That is, the color wasn't reliable. A drop of dilute sulfuric acid, which illustrated the effect even of the ordinary acids of the air, turned it blue. Eight years later, a team of British chemists at Carlisle solved the problem by a simple chemical process. 
They methylated the dye stuff on the 11th of September, 1920, and when the same test was made with sulfuric acid, the color stayed fast. The result was the best green dye yet made. This chemist is preparing a simple orange dye. He's only checking up on the quality of the ingredients, but this sort of test is an important part of normal routine. This particular color will be what's known as an azo dye. Azo dyes are made by combining together two chemical compounds. Neither of these is a dye, but they both contain chemical groupings, which when the chemist combines them, like this, can produce a definite color. Now he throws in some ordinary salt. This precipitates the dye, so that it can be dried off, ready for use. This porcelain dish is filled with phthalo dinitrile, which the chemist is heating with a copper salt. The smoke results from an important chemical reaction, a reaction which represents a major discovery in the field of British chemistry. From this discovery comes the only perfect blue pigment. Pigments are used for making paints and also for colouring things like rubber, plastics and linoleum in a way which isn't possible with dye stuffs. And this liquid isn't the finished product, but it contains the pigment which is filtered off as a powder, the finest blue pigment ever made. But the discovery of new dyes and pigments isn't the whole story. Dye stuffs chemists are continually experimenting in the methods of applying dyes to all sorts of material. This hank of cotton, surprisingly enough, is being dyed yellow. Like the jade green, this dye has to be converted to the dyeable form before the cotton can take the colour. Once the blue solution has thoroughly dyed the cotton, all that remains to be done is to reform the original yellow dye. All dyes won't dye all materials. This man is dyeing three separate hanks made up of natural silk, viscous rayon and acetate rayon, all widely used in everyday life. He uses only one bath, which contains three distinct dye stuffs, and each hank comes out a different colour. This is because each dye only takes on the material for which it has its own special affinity. For nearly a century now, scientists have been ceaselessly experimenting into the nature and mystery of colour, creating round us this new age, the golden age of colour. In the factories, technical chemists take over from the laboratory workers. Here, the cubic centimetre of the test tube gives way to the gallon measure of the production vat. Here, new discoveries come into production, side by side with dyes which have been in constant manufacture for many years.
without color, the new blocks of flats over our cities may all look alike. But with color, they become the separate living places of people who can never be standardized. And color is essential to the organization of the community, too. Color helps to conduct the traffic. The bus conductress would find her work twice as hard if her tickets weren't colored. Safety on railways depends on color. And so does much of the efficiency of the great modern offices. Color control indicates the various departments. It speeds up distribution. It orders and coordinates the filing system. It saves time and trouble in the building of radio sets by making the wiring and components easy to identify. It's a means by which sorters in the post office can tell at a glance if letters and parcels have been properly stamped. Young or old, you live in a world of color. There's everyday color and holiday color. When work's over, color is a holiday by itself. If you take it away, so much beauty and gaiety are taken too. Color blocks and bricks, paint boxes and jigsaw shapes make children happy while they learn. Bright toys teach their hands and their minds. In these and many other ways, color brings to the workaday world a kaleidoscope of dazzling beauty.